Do you want to watch TV? The president asked suddenly. So, me and the president of America watched TV while I ate my breakfast. Later, when we were back in the garden, the president said, You were hurt, weren't you, boy? Well, look at this. And he pulled up his shirt and showed me the place on his stomach where he was hurt once. Where were you hurt? he asked me. So I pulled down my trousers, turned round, and showed him. Well, lots of newspaper men started taking photographs before Colonel Gooch could run across and pull me away. That afternoon, back at the hotel, he came to my room shouting and throwing newspapers onto the bed. And there I was, on the front page, with my trousers down. Gump, you idiot! shouted Colonel Gooch. Yes, sir, I said. That's what I am. But I just try to do the right thing. CD 2 Chapter 7 Meeting Jenny Again Soon after that, I heard that I was leaving the army early, and they gave me some money for a train ticket to go home. But all this time, I was thinking about Jenny Curran. Just before I left the hospital in Da Nang, I had a letter from her. She was now playing in a group called The Broken Eggs, and they played two nights each week at a place called The Ho Daddy Club near Harvard University. Now that I was free from the army, I just wanted to go and see her. So, I got a ticket for Boston instead of Mobile. I tried to walk to the Ho Daddy Club from the train station, but I lost my way, so I took a taxi. It was in the afternoon, and the man behind the bar said, Jenny'll be here about nine o'clock. Can I wait, I asked. Okay, he said. So I sat down and waited for five or six hours. Students began to come in, most of them wearing dirty jeans. The men had beards, and the women had long, untidy hair. Later, the group, the Broken Eggs, arrived. But I didn't see Jenny. Then they began to play, and they were loud. The music sounded like a plane that was taking off, but the students loved it. And then Jenny came on. She was different. Her hair was all the way down her back, and she was wearing sunglasses at night. She was wearing blue jeans and a shirt with lots of colors on it. The group started playing again, and Jenny began to sing. Later, I went outside and walked around for about half an hour, then went back. There were a lot of people waiting to go in, so I went round to the back of the place and sat on the ground. I had my harmonica in my pocket, so I took it out and started to play. I could hear the music that was playing inside, and after a minute or two, I began playing with it. Suddenly, a door behind me opened, and there was Jenny. Who is that playing the harmonica? she said and then she saw me. Forrest Gump! And she ran out of the door and threw her arms round me. 
We talked together until it was time for her to sing again. I didn't leave school, said Jenny. They threw me out after they found a boy in my room one night. I went to California and stayed there for some time. She laughed. I wore flowers in my hair and talked about love. But the people that I was with were strange. Then I met a man, and we came to Boston. But he was dangerous. He was against the war, like me. But he blew up buildings and things. I couldn't stay with him. Next, I met a teacher from Harvard University but he was married. Then I began to sing with the broken eggs. Where do you live, I asked. With my boyfriend, she said. He's a student. You can come back and stay with us tonight. The boyfriend's name was Rudolph. He was a little man, and he was sitting on the floor with his eyes shut when we got to Jenny's flat. Rudolph, this is Forrest, Jenny said. He's a friend of mine from home, and he's going to stay with us for a few days. Rudolph didn't speak or open his eyes, but he put up his hand and smiled. Next morning, when I got up, Rudolph was still sitting on the floor with his eyes shut. That afternoon, Jenny took me to meet the other people in the group, and that night, I began playing my harmonica with them at the Ho Daddy Club. It went well, and I played with them every night after that. Then one day, I came back to the flat, and Jenny was sitting on the floor. Where's Rudolph, I asked. Gone, she said. Walked out, like all the others. And then she started to cry. Don't cry, Jenny, I said, and I put my arm round her. Well, it started like that, but the next minute we were kissing and making love. And when we finished, Jenny said, Forrest, where have you been all this time? Chapter 8 Into Space Spring and summer went by, and I continued to play my harmonica with the group. It was my happiest time of all. But, you've guessed it, something went wrong. How did it happen? I don't know. But one night I was sitting outside the Ho Daddy Club, smoking a cigarette, when a girl smiled and came up to me. She sat down across my legs and put her arms round me. She was laughing and kissing me, and I didn't know what to do. Suddenly, the door opened behind me, and there was Jenny. Forrest, it's time to... She stopped when she saw me with the girl. Then she said, Oh, no, not you, too. I jumped up and pushed the girl away. Jenny, I said. Stay away from me, Forrest, she said. You men are all the same. Just stay away from me. She didn't speak to me again that night. And the next morning, she told me to find another place to live. I went to live with Moses, one of the other men in the group. And soon after that, Jenny went to Washington to talk and work against the war. Moses wrote down the address for me. So I went back to Washington, too. There was a lot of trouble there. Police were everywhere, 
and people were shouting and throwing things, and the police were taking some of them away. I went to find Jenny's address, but there was nobody at home. I waited outside for most of the day. Then, at about nine o'clock, a car stopped near the house, and some people got out. And there she was. I started to walk towards her, but she turned and walked away. The other people, two men and a girl, didn't know what to say. What's wrong with her, I asked one of the two men. She just got out of prison, he said. She was there all night before we could get her out. Jenny was in the back of the car now, so I went over and talked to her through the window. I told her how I felt. I was sorry about the girl, and I didn't want to play in the group without her. She listened quietly, then opened the car door for me to get in, and we sat and talked. The others were talking about something that would happen the next day. Some American soldiers planned to take off their Vietnam medals and throw them away in front of the crowds of people. Suddenly, Jenny said, Did you know that Forrest won a medal? The others went quiet and looked at me, then looked at Jenny. Next morning, Jenny came into the living room. I was sleeping on the floor of their house. She woke me up. Forrest, she said, I want you to do something for me. What, I said. I want you to come with us today, and I want you to wear your army clothes. Why, I asked. Because you're going to do something to stop all the killing in Vietnam. You can guess what I had to do, can't you? I had to throw away my medal with the other American soldiers. But because my medal was a more famous medal than theirs, it was more important to Jenny and her friends. But it got me into more trouble. Oh, I threw my medal away okay, but it hit somebody really important. One of the president's men. So they threw me into prison. Why did things like that always happen to me? As it happened, I didn't stay in prison long because they soon realized that I was an idiot and they put me in a special hospital for idiots. It was the doctors at the hospital who decided to send me to NASA. That's the space center at Houston in Texas. You're just the kind of person they're looking for, the doctors told me. I soon understood why. NASA sent me on a journey into space with a woman and an ape. Me, a spaceman. It was very strange. All kinds of things went wrong because of that ape. Instead of coming down in the sea when we returned, the spaceship came down in the jungle somewhere, and it was four years before the NASA people found us. But the ape and I were soon good friends. His name was Sue. Yes, I know it's a girl's name, but they sent a male ape up by mistake, and NASA didn't like to tell the newspapers that. And it was in the jungle that I met Big Sam, a man who taught me to play chess. And that was important, as you will see later. Chapter 9 A Real Idiot Of course, the first thing that I wanted to do when I got back to America was find Jenny, so I phoned Moses in Boston. 
The Broken Eggs group has broken up, he told me. I don't know what happened to Jenny. I heard that she went to Chicago, but that was five years ago. Do you have a telephone number or anything? I asked. It's an old number, he said, but perhaps she's still there. I phoned the number, and she wasn't. Jenny Curran, a man's voice said. She went to Indianapolis, got a job at the Temperer factory. So I went to Indianapolis on the bus. The Temperer factory was outside the town. I asked about Jenny at the office, and the woman said, Yes, she works in here. Why don't you wait at the side of the factory? It's almost lunchtime, and she'll probably come out. So I did. A lot of people came out at lunchtime. Then Jenny came out. She went and sat under a tree on the grass and began eating an apple. I went up behind her and said, That looks like a nice apple. She didn't look up. She just said, Forrest, it has to be you. A minute later, I had my arms round her, and we were both crying. People were watching us with strange looks on their faces, but it didn't matter. Jenny and me were together again. I finish work in three hours, Forrest, Jenny said. Why don't you wait for me in that bar across the street? Then I'll take you to my place. So I waited in the bar. And I got into the wrestling business. How? I'll tell you. It started when I arm wrestled a man in the bar and won some money on a bet. That gave me an idea. But at first, I didn't say anything to Jenny. She came across to the bar after work, and we had a drink and talked. I saw you on TV when you went up into Space Forest, she said. And I told her all about that, and about Sue, the ape. What happened to him? she asked. I don't know, I said, but he was a good friend. Later, we went back to Jenny's flat, and she said, You can stay here. Next day, when Jenny went to work, I went back to the bar. Several people wanted to try arm wrestling with me again, and I said, Okay. None of them won, because I was too strong, but plenty of people wanted to try their luck. After about a month, I was winning nearly $200 a week arm wrestling. Then one day, a man called Mike came into the bar. You can make a lot more money, he told me. How? I asked. Uh, wrestling. Real wrestling, he said. I can teach you. To make a long story short, he did. Jenny wasn't happy about the wrestling, but I won a lot of money, sometimes by winning fights, sometimes by losing them, because Mike told me to lose them. Yes, that happens too. But then I did something stupid again. I bet on myself winning a fight after Mike told me to lose it. Jenny got really angry. It isn't honest, she said. I didn't listen. I bet all my money on myself to win, and then I lost the fight. But there was worse to come. When I got back to the flat, Jenny was gone, and there was a letter waiting for me. It said, 
Dear Forrest, You're doing something bad tonight. It isn't honest, and I cannot go on with you like this. I think about having a house and a family and things like that now. I watched you grow up big and strong and good, and then in Boston, I realized that I loved you, and I was the happiest girl in the world. But then there was that girl outside the Ho Daddy Club. Then you went up into space, and I lost you for four years, and I think you changed. And I think perhaps I changed, too. I just want to live in an ordinary way now, so I must go and find it. I'm crying while I write this, but please don't try to find me. Goodbye, my dear. Love, Jenny. And for the first time ever, I knew that I was a real idiot. Chapter 10 Money for Playing Games I decided to go home to Mobile, but the bus stopped at Nashville on the way, and I went into town for a drink and something to eat. I was going past the hotel when I looked in the window and saw some people who were playing chess. Like I said before, Big Sam taught me how to play chess when I was in the jungle. Well, I went into the hotel to watch them, but it was a special chess tournament, and it cost five dollars to watch, so I didn't go into the chess room. I was just walking out again when I saw a little old man who was playing chess with himself at a table near the door. I had another hour before I had to catch the bus again, so I went across and watched him. Then I said, If you make that move, you'll lose your queen. He didn't look up, but after a minute, he said, Perhaps you're right. It was time for me to get back to the bus station, but when I started to leave, the old man said, Why don't you sit down and finish this game with me? I can't, I said. I have to catch a bus. So he waved at me with his hand, and I went back to the bus station. But I missed the bus that evening and there wasn't another one until the next day. So I walked back to the hotel, and there was the little old man, still playing against himself. He looked up and saw me, and told me to sit down. It took me an hour to win that chess game. Just who are you? he said after the game. Forrest Gump, I said. Where did you learn to play chess? He asked. In the jungle, I told him. He looked surprised. Aren't you in the tournament? He asked. No, I told him. I'm going home, and I'm going to start a shrimp business. You can make a lot of money from chess, he said. You're very good. Am I? I said. The old man's name was Mr. Tribble. Two days later, we were on our way to Los Angeles to a big chess tournament. We were a day or two early for the tournament, and Mr. Tribble took me to see some people who were making a film. They make a lot of films, in Los Angeles. We were watching a man who was crashing through a window in a film fight when a man walked over to us. Are you an actor? He asked me. Who? Me? I said. 
We're here for the chess tournament, said Mr. Tribble. But the other man was looking at me. You are a big, strong man, aren't you? He said. You're just what I need for a film that I'm making. My name is Felder. He has to play chess in a tournament tomorrow, said Mr. Tribble. He hasn't got time to be an actor. It won't take long, said Mr. Felder. So we went with Mr. Felder, and I found myself acting in a film about the jungle with Raquel Welch, the famous film star. Is that really Raquel Welch, I asked Mr. Felder. But things did not go well. Somehow, when I was helping Miss Welch to escape from the jungle, her dress came off, and I had to run into the trees to hide her. But who do you think we met there? Sue! The ape, he was in another film. The three of us ran out of there fast, and Miss Welch shouted and screamed. No, things didn't go very well. I wasn't an actor for very long. I think Mr. Tribble was secretly pleased. I was pleased because I was back with Sue again. Back at our hotel, the three of us sat in our room and tried to decide what to do. It's going to be difficult traveling with an ape, said Mr. Tribble. He won't be any trouble, Mr. Tribble, I said. But Mr. Tribble seemed worried. Next day was the big chess tournament at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Mr. Tribble and I got there early, and I had to play chess all day. It took me about seven minutes to win the first game, and half an hour to win the next. I played all that day and the next, and suddenly I was in the final, playing with the Russian, Honest Ivan, the best player in the world. He was a big man with long black hair, and he didn't want to lose. It was a long game. Honest Ivan was good, very good. But just when Honest Ivan seemed to be winning, Sue ran across the room and jumped onto the chess table. Honest Ivan fell off his chair, and everybody started screaming and running everywhere. Let's get out of here, Forrest, shouted Mr. Tribble. We got back to the hotel and hurried up to our room. Forrest, said Mr. Tribble, you're a wonderful chess player, but I never know what's going to happen next. Here's half of the money that you've won. It's almost $5,000. Take Sue back to Alabama with you and start your shrimp business. He shook my hand and gave me his address. Write to me sometimes, Forrest. Good luck. Chapter 11 The Shrimp Business Well, I finally went home to Mobile again. The train got into Mobile Station about three o'clock in the morning, and Sue and I got off. We walked into the town and finally found a place to sleep in an empty building. The next morning, I bought some breakfast and got Sue some bananas to eat. Then we went to see Mom. She was pleased to see me. Oh, Forrest, she said. You're home at last. Yes, Mom, I said. But I didn't stay long. Two days later, Sue and I got the bus to Biola Battery, where Bubba's parents lived, and I explained to Bubba's daddy about the shrimp business 
that Bubba and I planned to start after we came out of the army. He listened, and he was very interested. And the next day, he took Sue and me out in his little boat to look for a good place to start the shrimp business. It took almost a month to start things up, to get nets and a boat and everything. Finally, the day came when Sue and I were ready to go shrimping, and by that night, we had hundreds and hundreds of shrimps in our nets. It was the beginning of my shrimp business. We worked hard all that summer and that autumn and winter and the next spring. And after a year, Mom was working for me and Mr. Tribble and Curtis, my old football friend, and Bubba's daddy. At the end of that year, we had $30,000. Everybody was very happy, but me? I was thinking of Jenny, of course. I wanted to find her again, and one day I dressed in my best clothes and got the bus to Mobile, and I went to Jenny's mom's house. Forrest Gump, she said when she saw me. Come on in. Well, we talked about mom and the shrimp business and everything. Then I asked about Jenny. I don't hear from her very often, she said. I think they live somewhere in North Carolina now. They, I said. Didn't you know, she said. Jenny married two years ago. Why wasn't I ready for that news? I don't know, but I wasn't. And part of me seemed to die when I heard it. But Jenny only did what she had to do, because I'm an idiot. A lot of people say that they married an idiot, but they don't know what it's like to marry a real one. I cried that night, but it didn't help. I'm just going to work hard, I told myself. It's all I can do. And I did. And at the end of that year, we had $75,000. Time went on. I looked in the mirror and saw lines on my face and gray in my hair. The business was doing well, but I asked myself, what are you doing all this for? And I knew that I had to get away. Mr. Tribble understood. Well, why don't you tell everybody that you're taking a long holiday, Forrest? He said. The business will be here when you want it again. So I did. Sue came with me, and we went to the bus station. Where do you want to go? The woman in the ticket office asked. I don't know, I said. Why don't you go to Savannah? She said. It's a nice town. Okay, I said. Chapter 12 Little Forest Sue and I got off the bus at Savannah. Then I went and got a cup of coffee and sat outside the bus station. What could I do next? I didn't know. So after I finished my cup of coffee, I took out my harmonica and began to play. I played two songs, and a man walked past and threw some money into my empty coffee cup. I played two more songs, and soon the cup was half full of money. By the end of the next week, we were getting ten dollars a day. Then, one afternoon when I was playing to some people in the park, 
I noticed that a little boy was watching me carefully. Then I looked up and saw a woman who was standing near him. It was Jenny Curran. Her hair was different, and she looked a bit older and a bit tired, but it was her all right. And when I finished playing, she held the little boy's hand and came across. She was smiling. Oh, Forrest, I knew it was you when I heard that harmonica. Nobody plays the harmonica like you do. What are you doing here? I asked her. We live here now, she said. Donald works in a business here in Savannah. We came here about three years ago. When I stopped playing, the rest of the people walked away. Jenny sat next to me while the little boy started playing with Sue. Why are you playing your harmonica in the park? asked Jenny. Mom wrote and told me about your shrimp business and how rich you were. It's a long story, I said. Is that your little boy? Yes, she said. What do you call him? His name is Forrest, she said quietly. Then she went on. He's half yours. He's your son, Forrest. I looked at the boy, who was still playing with Sue. My son? I knew that a baby was on the way when I left Indianapolis, said Jenny. But I didn't want to say anything. I don't know why. I was worried that perhaps... Perhaps he would be an idiot, I finished for her. Yes, but Forrest, he's not an idiot. He's really clever. Are you sure that he's mine? I asked. I'm sure, said Jenny. He wants to be a football player. I looked at the boy. Can I see him for a minute or two? Of course, said Jenny, and she called to him. Forrest, I want you to meet another Forrest. He's an old friend of mine. The boy came and sat down. What a funny animal you've got, he said. He's an ape, I said. His name is Sue. Why is it called Sue if it's a he? I knew then that I didn't have an idiot for a son. Your mom tells me that you want to be a football player. Yes, he said. Do you know anything about football? A bit, I said. But ask your daddy. He'll know more than me. He put his arms round me for a second, then went off to play with Sue again. Jenny looked at me. How long have we been friends, Forrest? Thirty years? Sometimes it doesn't seem true. She moved nearer and gave me a kiss. Idiots, said Jenny. Who isn't an idiot? Then she got up and held little Forrest's hand, and they walked away. Well, after that, I did a few things. First, I phoned Mr. Trimble and told him to give some of my money from the shrimp business to my mom and some to Bubba's daddy. Then, send the rest to Jenny and little Forrest, I said. That night, I sat up thinking. Perhaps I can put things right with Jenny, I thought, now that i found her again. But the more I thought about it, the more I finally understood 
that it was better for the boy to be with Jenny and her husband and not to have an idiot for a father. An idiot? Yes, I'm an idiot. But most of the time, I just try to do the right thing.